Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. The great songwriter Johnny Mandel wrote in the theme song for MASH that suicide is painless. It's not. The emotional pain and depression that often precedes it is anything but. Moreover, the pain for the survivors is unfathomable. And yet we have been witnessing an epidemic of suicide among some of our best and brightest young people today. Suicide is, in fact, the second leading cause of death among college students today. And back in 2014 and 2015, even such an esteemed institution as MIT experienced a suicide cluster resulting in the death of six students and one faculty member. Because of its deeply personal nature, the search for symptoms and causes needs to be more personal than clinical. After the MIT suicides, an MIT computer science professor, Daniel Jackson, set out to do something to begin to understand what happened and at the same time to help others. What he did reached not into the pharmacy, but into the soul of his students. The end result is the book Portraits of Resilience, but the journey that he and his students took is important for all of us to understand. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Daniel Jackson here to the program. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. I'm delighted to have you here. First of all, tell us what happened back then and, and this cluster of suicides that took place. Well, it, it was a terrible period, um, and there was a lot of despondency um, on campus. Um, in, in my own sense of things, it was really just the tip of an iceberg of unhappiness that we were like, like, in fact, most universities in the country, experiencing epidemic rates of depression. And I was um, experiencing that with students coming to talk to me all the time, increasing numbers of students in the classes I w was teaching. You know, would come and talk to me and say that they were struggling with their work, and it would turn out that they were actually being held back by depression or anxiety um, or other related um, mental health challenges. And, um, and I was thinking at the time, as, you know, as many of us were, you know, whether there was something I might I might do to to help a little bit um, to counter this uh, this uh, this terrible situation. And not only thinking about what to do, did you have a sense of what was different about this time? You've been doing this a while. You've been dealing with students for a long time. What was different this time? Wow, that's really hard to say. Um, I'm not sure. I think you know. I think I've been teaching for a long time. Actually, it's uh, gosh, it's, it's actually almost 30 years since I got my PhD, which is kind of scary. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think that it was a sense that um, just the sheer numbers were increasing. You know, I hadn't previously, um, I hadn't previously experienced any like anything like that number of students who were who were coming to talk to me. Um, and, um, and I think that a lot of the pressures that we put on students have just got steadily worse over time. Um, you know, sort of starting with, you know, in, in high school or even earlier with the pressures, you know, to have a polished resume. Um, and then the, you know, the, the pressures that probably may be resulting from, you know, the, uh, the downturn in the economy to making it harder to find a job. Uh, and all around, I think our students just feel, um, that they're sort of triaging their way through a world of, you know, uh, of obstacles. And when this happened and you wanted to do something, wanted to make a contribution, talk a little bit about how you thought you could do something with your, with, not with your computer science hat on, but with your photographer's hat on. Right. Well, that, yes, and that was a very exciting opportunity for me because I've been a photographer for a long time. And... Um, and actually, it started, it started when I read a couple of articles um, that were published in our school newspaper, actually at the height of the, of the suffering that was <clears throat> going on at MIT in a week, actually, in, the, uh, in March of 2015, when, when two students took their lives. And I, I noticed that when people wrote articles in which they, they named themselves and were candid about their experiences, there was this kind of wave of consolation. Um, that swept through campus, and I realized that there was something tremendously powerful, powerful about, you know, putting a face, metaphorically as it were, you know, to, to these problems, and I realized, you know, um, it occurred to me that it would be even more wonderful to put a face literally uh, to these experiences. Um, you know, we'd left these people who, who had actually been suffering from depression and anxiety and had the most to teach us about these things, 
um, had ironically often been the people who were the last ones that we actually went to uh, to enlighten us. You know, we had a lot of discussions about um, resilience and depression and so on. But these people essentially had been left out in the dark. Um, and I thought that it would be wonderful to, to, to make a gallery um, of faces that, so that people could look at these faces and read stories um, by the people portrayed and, and get a sense that they, that they were not alone. Um, we had a, uh, a sort of culture of um, anonymity, which it finally dawned on me was in some ways very damaging. Um, there's, a, there's a quite understandable sense that people want to preserve their privacy, but um, many of the people who suffered or are suffering from depression and anxiety have uh, overwhelming feelings of shame associated with that. And um, in some respects, I think that encouraging people to express um, you know, to tell their stories and express themselves an anonymously, actually perversely can actually increase that sense of shame because it, it conveys a message that somehow this is not stuff to be, you know, to be admitted publicly. Uh, and yet I think, you know, the, the key to, to the healing process um, is to recognize that, that that shame is misplaced and that these are, um, that these are things that happen to very many people um, for no fault of their own. And when these suicides happened, how difficult was it for people to talk about it on campus? How was it dealt with among students and among your conversations with students? Well, I have to admit, I didn't have many discussions about suicide um, with students. <clears throat> they, they tend to be very private about, you know, these, these very painful issues. I know that um, and I know actually through talking to students then actually who I interviewed as part of my project, then I began to learn a lot about it. Um, and they told me a lot about how, um, how the, you know, the weight of, a, of, of the tragedy of a student, student suicide would, would ripple through all the students, even the students who didn't know the person who's, who, who had lost their lives. Um, it, was a, it was a terrible and traumatic experience for, for uh, for so many students, um, and uh, and that was actually one of the one of the many things that became clear to me, um, and that I hadn't understood when I started the project, how deep and pervasive the pain was throughout the student body. And as this project got started, talk a little bit about how it began, how the photographs began, and and really expanded out from that into uh, the Resilience Project and ultimately this book. Sure. Well. The way it began is that I had this idea in the um, summer of 2015 um, that, I, that I would try and put together a gallery of photographs of people who had, uh, who had experienced depression or anxiety. Um, and it, it had been seeded by those articles that I mentioned in the school newspaper um, where a couple of uh, brave souls had told their stories of, of depression. Um, and so I approached three people who in the past um, had told their stories um, and over that summer and asked if, that, if they would, were interested in this project and would be willing to be guinea pigs. And they responded incredibly generously and enthusiastically. And so in the fall, excuse me, in the fall of 2015, um, I photographed um, those three people. Um, uh, one of them was a faculty member and two of them, one a former student and one a current student. Um, and, um, and began to sort of put together, I interviewed them, um, I'd originally had this idea that I was going to have a short and pithy excerpt uh, to, as a sort of caption for the photograph, but then it turned out when I talked to them that they, they, they shared with me basically their entire life stories. These are just incredibly moving and wise um, accounting of, of, of what had happened in their life and how, how they'd been struck by depression, how, how they'd come to terms with it, and in some cases recovered from it. Um, so by the end of by the end of the fall of 2015, I, I sort of had a few sample stories and photos, um, and I began to connect to actually to some students. I, I I connected to some undergraduate students who were um, the chairs of a committee called the Undergraduate Association Committee on Wellness, um, and they worked with me to advertise to sort of to promote the project amongst the undergraduate student body. Um, and to connect to the school newspaper. And we actually negotiated that we would have a, a, a photograph and an accompanying story in every issue of the, of the newspaper every week, which was actually a little frightening because at that point I only had three stories. Um, and, that, and that's how it happened. We, we, we put the stories in, in the newspaper. We plastered 
posters all over campus saying, you know, go read this amazing story, and if you have a story to tell, um, come and tell us. Um, and people started contacting us. What did it tell you that you didn't already know or understand about the intimacy of photographs and what they could accomplish? I think the biggest surprise to me, um, which perhaps I should have realized already, was that the very act of being photographed in a respectful um, and attentive way um, is a kind of recognition which uh, is important. Um, it shows somebody that, that they're not on the margins, that they're actually uh, important and central. Uh, and I was very moved by, um, by how, pe how positively people reacted to having their portrait made. I had sort of expected, actually, that the entire experience of being photographed and telling a story would be just a very altruistic and generous one, which it certainly was for all of my subjects. And, and it's quite amazing, if you read the stories, how open and sharing they are about the most extraordinary intimate details of their lives. Um, so there is that enormous uh, altruism um, and, you know, the potential, you know, the potential concerns they had about employers reading this stuff and so on. But at the same time, I hadn't anticipated the way that the telling of the story, the publishing of the photograph and the story, the, the act of being photographed would turn out to be a kind of... Um, almost a cathartic experience for, um, for my subjects and just being with them and talking to them. It was, I think, a very moving um, and uh, enriching experience for, for, for all of us, for, certainly, of course, for me enormously, but I think also for them. And that, and that was a big surprise to me. Right. And, and the fact that they were willing to tell as intimate a, a series of stories as they did, I mean, that seems surprising on a certain level. And might, might it not have happened or might it not have been the case if it hadn't been for these other suicides and the feeling that was really permeating the campus? I think it was certainly partly that. You know, m most of the students that I spoke to um, had this very strong sense that they wanted to um, they wanted to give back that by doing this, they were contributing to improving the atmosphere, not only at MIT, which, which of course is, you know, what, not what the book is aimed at. The book is, in a sense, I think of it as a gift from MIT, you know, to other campuses in the world out there. They knew that this was a very public thing and that, that they were contributing to that. Um, but I think, I actually think that, um, there's something about this generation which is different. Um, I happen to be listening to a, um, a, a, um, an edition of On Being, Krista Tippett's mm -hmm. uh, NPR show. And she made a comment um, out of the blue that, that blew me away in which she said that she thought that this, that this generation of millennials have a kind of openness that's almost a new kind of morality, that they have a sense of being open to the world and willing to share their experience, which is really new in human history. And I certainly experienced that. And I think if you read these stories, you know, you get the sense that this is, this is something different. Um, you know, because one of my colleagues had commented to me early on, you know, oh, wow, you know, you won't have any trouble getting old fogies like us, you know, ten tenured professors to talk about their troubles. But, you know, try getting anything like that from, from a young person. They have so much to lose, you know, they won't do it. And in fact, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. And, and so I think there's some generational thing going on there that, um, that this generation is, has, has this incredible sense of um, integrity and candor and openness and willingness to share things that they think are important for other people to hear. Was there input or were there any comments or, or anything from mental health professionals with respect to what you were doing? Well, we did, yes. So we, we made contact with the um, psychiatrists and psychologists at the MIT, um, in the MIT Mental Health Department, um, and they were always there to, to lend a hand and be helpful. Um, in the end, we didn't, we didn't talk to them very much. There were a couple of, there was actually just one case in which we were a little concerned um, that something in one of the stories about what might have been read as an attempted suicide might, um, might disturb or trigger people, and so we, we sought advice on that. Um, but by and large, um, it, was, um, it was a project really of just listening to people and telling their stories. It was also the sense that, that sunlight itself, that exposing this in some ways took the edge off of it. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I think also it's, uh, you know, when, when I've um, 
talk to people since the publication of the book, um, you know, uh, a couple of people have commented to me that um, it sort of validated their own experiences in a way that they'd never imagined it would, that things that that now seem so straightforward that, that they read in these stories, sort of common patterns of, of how, these, how these issues come up, that they thought were peculiar to them, that, there was, that they were somehow out of, you know, that, that, that they couldn't account for their own experiences and that they were alone and that this is very unusual, just to see that, um, that there were other people who had had exactly the same experiences, I think was very validating. And how did things progress after all of this in terms of other suicides and what happened at MIT? Well, it's very hard, you know, it's very hard to say. I mean, there's been a lot of debate about whether or not the suicide rate actually is statistically significant. Um, You know, one of the very exciting things that happened was that um, as I was, you know, preparing the the project for publication as a book, when we realized, you know, that we had this amazing collection of, of, of stories, more than I ever imagined we'd have, um, there was um, a lot of very generous support um, from the community. First, grants to help bring down the price of the book, because I wanted to publish this very nice, you know, sort of art quality book, but one, we really wanted it to be affordable, and so um, there was a lot of help with grants. But then, um, there were a group of alumni who got together um, and raised enough money to buy a copy of the book for every incoming freshman mm. um, last fall. And we actually just finished handing out all those books um, over the course of the last few months. And so different residence halls and dorms um, have been holding events um, in which they've been handing out these books and talking about the stories. And in fact, there's going to be a freshman seminar um, in the fall that will use the book on the subject of resilience and life skills. So, so it's early to say, but I'm very hopeful that um, that the book will will play, you know, maybe a small part, but will play play a part in in helping turn things around and and making uh, making life a bit easier um, for all these students, you know, with all the stresses that they face. What did you learn in the process of doing this about the resilience of young people today? Uh, wow, um, that it's extraordinary <laughs> that young people that you know certainly all the people I spoke to um, have dealt with quite enormous hardships and obstacles, um, and that they really that they have a degree of maturity and ability to face reality that that I just. I certainly didn't have at that age. There's, well, there's one story in the book which is quite amazing um, by um, a fellow called Dylan Salkup, who was actually the, um, the head of the ambulance crew that picked up um, Officer Sean Collier on the night that he was killed by the Boston Marathon mm-hmm. terrorists. Um, and he tells a story of um, not only how, you know, how they um, worked that night and how they took him to the hospital and so on, but how they created a whole sort of community around the ambulance crew um, to to support those people and to um, help them get through that unbelievably traumatic experience. Um, and I, I was blown away by it, to be honest. I, I, um, I'm not sure where it comes from, but there's uh, uh, certainly from what I see in this generation, um, a quite extraordinary degree of wisdom and strength in how they deal with these challenges. And is this an ongoing project, Daniel? You know, I, I haven't figured out what to do next. I've, I've had a, um, a lot of interesting discussions with people who've contacted me, um, you know, when they've, when they've seen the book um, and who would like to tell their stories. And I'm really trying to figure out what, what the next project should be. Uh, so that's an exciting thing that, that I'm working on. Professor Daniel Jackson, the book is Portraits of Resilience. It's out from MIT Press. Daniel, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.